In this lesson, we'll take a look at the history of the cell theory. Now, the cell theory states that all living things are composed of these units that we call cells. And, for example, animals and plants are made of multiple cells, and some organisms are just single-celled organisms. Now, the history of the cell theory really uh, took off with the invention of the microscope, but we're going to pick up our story after the invention of the microscope with MFX Bichat, who was working in the late 1700s. And he was not using microscopes, but he was interested in the composition of organs. And he used various ways to dissect and chemically tease apart the components of organs, for example, the heart. And so he identified the heart is composed of muscle tissue and nerve tissue and connective tissue, etc. So he began to conceptualize organs as being composed of tissues. Now he did not know at the time, because he wasn't using microscopes, that uh, later researchers uh, would identify tissues as being composed of cells. But first we have the, uh, the first observation here in our list, and that is the observation that organs are composed of tissues. So, for example, nerve tissue might be found in the heart, but also, of course, in the brain. Muscle tissue might be found in the heart, but also there is skeletal muscle. And connective tissue can be found all over the body. But nevertheless, body organs were composed of tissues. Now, let's pick up the story with those using microscopes. An early user of microscopes was Robert Hooke in the uh, 1600s. And one of his famous observations occurred when he put a very thin slice of cork, which is dead plant tissue. He put cork under the microscope. And here we're sort of drawing what he observed. He observed these tiny, hollow, empty chambers. And he called them cells. Uh, Hook thought they reminded him of little rooms, the small rooms that monks used to transcribe Bibles in the Middle Ages. And so he coined the word cell to refer to these little change chambers. And this is where we get the word cell. Now, he did not know at the time uh, that he was uh, observing the fundamental unit of life. Um, that would take a lot more research to, uh, to establish. But he is notable because he made lots of interesting observations with early microscopes, and he introduces the term cell to refer to these chambers. We now know that the boundary, the outer wall of the chamber, is the plant cell wall. Cork is plant tissue, and what we're looking at are dead plant cells, but the cell wall still retains its shape. Another early user of microscopes was Anton van Leeuwenhoek, uh, again in the 1600s, and his uh, microscope can be seen here. A very small and simple device, but he made very good lenses. And when he investigated pond water and other such things, he found living organisms. Today, we would identify them as amoeba and paramecia. And these were organisms that were single-celled organisms. They moved about as though they were sort of like animals, but we'll see that animals are multi-celled. These were single-celled organisms. Nobody had uh, known they existed until the invention of microscopes. Next on our list is uh, Henri Dutrochet, working in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And he's going to call attention to the fluid within these living cells. So while uh, Hook was looking at dead plant tissue, and therefore they were empty of any fluid, living cells had fluid inside. And we call that fluid the cytoplasm. Now Dutrochet helped us conceptualize what was going on in this fluid. He argued that the chemistry of life was happening in this fluid. So these chambers were living units. They were taking nutrients from their environment, doing complex chemistry, the chemistry that kept the cell alive, and as a result of that chemistry, waste was eliminated. So Dutrochet helps us understand that that these chambers that Hooke identified and called cells were actually living things. And they were alive in virtue of the interesting chemistry that was happening in the fluid within the boundary of the cell. Next on our list is a botanist by the name of Schleiden, working in the 1800s. And he was interested in plants, and he put many different kinds of plants under the microscope and concluded that plants are multicellular. They are not simply one large cell. They're made up of small cellular units that are stuck together. 
So for example, a leaf would be made up of these brick-like cells stuck together. Now each of these cells then would have to do what Dutrochet had argued, get nutrients from the environment, do complex chemistry in the fluid, and then export wastes. So nutrients, what are nutrients? Well, these would be materials, uh, substances in the environment that would be a source of building materials and energy for the chemistry going on inside the cell. But although each of these individual plant cells would be alive, uh, Schleiden pointed out that the cells existed in another interesting relationship with other cells of the plant. So for example, root cells are, are also alive, they're part of the plant. But the idea was that the leaf cells and the root cells must help each other in order that each type of cell could survive. So in this way cells lived a double life. On the one hand they could live independently so long as they got their nutrients and then got rid of their waste, but they can't get all the nutrients w without the help of other cells in the organism. So the root cells will be absorbing water and delivering water to the leaf cells and the leaf cells will be doing photosynthesis and making sugar and then deliver the sugar down to the root cells to keep them alive. There is a cooperative effort going on here in multicellular organisms. That's what he means by a double life. Cells are alive but they must cooperate to ensure that the whole organism is alive. Next on our list is Robert Brown. Robert Brown, working in the late 1700s, uh, is uh, credited with um, identifying what we will call the nucleus. So he found this oval structure uh, in many different kinds of cells that he was observing on the microscope and he called it the nucleus. Now at the time nobody really knew what the nucleus did or what it was for or whether it was important or not. We of course now know that inside the nucleus is DNA, one of the uh, really important molecules in biology. It's DNA that has the recipe to build an organism. Also in the 1800s, uh, a, uh, another uh, biologist by the name of Schwann, he was interested not in plants, he was interested in animals. And so like Schleiden, he tried to put as many different kinds of animal tissues under the microscope as possible. And he also concluded that animals too were multicellular. Now animals like plants that have specialized cells, leaf cells and root cells, animals also had specialized cells. They had here's some cheek cells and muscle cells and nerve cells. Uh, it's just that animals, it was more difficult to establish that they were composed of cells because it's harder to visualize animal tissue under the microscope. And this is why the discovery that animals were made of cells happened after plants. Um, to, to view animal cells you have to harden the tissue. Uh, you have to make the tissue physically hard so you can slice it into thin sections to put on a microscope slide. You cannot put thick things uh, on a microscope. The light has to go through the specimen for you to see any, uh, any detail. Uh, and in addition, animal tissue often doesn't really have much color. Plants are kind of naturally uh, sort of green, as we'll, and we'll see why in, in a moment. Uh, but animal tissue uh, doesn't show up very well unless you stain it. So various stains had to be developed so as to visualize animal tissue. So this, the, the fact that uh, animal tissue was hard to view meant that, uh, that the discovery was delayed compared to the, the discovery that plants were made of cells. Nevertheless, at this point then, we have plants being composed of cells, animals being composed of cells, and there are single-celled organisms, as uh, Leeuwenhoek discovered. Our final step in the, uh, in the cell theory is a contribution by others, but in, including uh, Virchow, and he is going to simply argue that cells come from other cells. Now at the time, and for a long time, people thought that living things could spontaneously generate. Living things could appear from non-living materials. And so perhaps cells could spontaneously generate. And he's going to uh, argue that cells don't spontaneously generate. Cells come from other cells. So in conclusion then, the cell theory has three basic parts to it. All living things are composed of cells or exist as a single cell. Cells are the basic unit of life. A cell is the smallest thing that has all of the properties of living things. In other words, the parts of the cell are not alive. And cells come from other cells, which means that living things can reproduce because cells can reproduce. 